This capsule is concerned with the effects of climate change on the well-being of children. In the initial part of the lecture, we define climate and weather, and we explain why we focus on the consequences of weather events or weather shocks rather than of climate change. We then briefly present the way weather events are measured in economic literature and the main data sources economists use to analyze their effects. In Section 2, we present the channels through which weather events produce short-run effects on a number of outcomes related to children. Section 3 introduces those outcomes, which affect health, schooling and learning, work, migration, marriage and fertility, and presents the main findings of economic literature on the short-term effects of weather events on each of them. We discuss in Section 4 the long-term effects of weather events, and we conclude by discussing the potential solutions to mitigate the adverse effects of weather events on child well-being. Let's start with concepts and data. According to the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, NOAA, Climate is defined as the long-term average of weather over a period of several decades. So when we talk about climate change, we are talking about changes in the long-term averages of daily weather. For example, with temperature, the observed increase in the average temperatures by about 2 degrees since the pre-industrial era of 1900 is considered as a change in climate. Climate change is thus illustrated by a number of slow onset events that include increases in temperature, desertification, loss of biodiversity, land and forest degradation, glacial retreating, ocean acidification, rising sea levels, and salinization. These events are barely perceptible to humans in their daily lives and thus have limited economic consequences at least in the short period. Climate change makes the occurrence of extreme weather events like tropical storms, floods, and droughts more frequent, and these types of weather events have much more important economic consequences. In the last decades, a growing body of research that studies the impact of weather events on economic outcomes emerged in economic literature. They've looked at aspects such as temperature, precipitation, and cyclones, etc. These studies usually make use of panel methodologies to identify the effects of high-frequency changes in precipitation, temperature, and other climactic variables. Economists are both interested in the effects of weather variations and of extreme weather events on economic outcomes. Some definitions are useful here. In the economic literature, the term weather variation is used to indicate variation in the short run of climactic variables, while the term climate is used to describe the distribution of the climactic variables over a longer period of time. For example, the range of annual precipitation realized in Madagascar over a century. The term weather shock is widely used in economic literature. We can define a weather shock for a given spatial entity and for a given time frame as a particular realization of the weather variable that deviates from the central tendency of the long-term distribution. In this respect, both extreme and less extreme deviations from the central tendency can be considered as weather shocks. A cyclone is a weather shock since the wind speed is higher than the usual speed. Droughts are a weather shock because the quantity of rainfall is lower than usual. But following this definition, a 20% higher rainfall relative to the normal local rainfall can also be considered as a weather shock. Since economists are mainly interested in the effects of the short-term variation of climactic variables, the economic literature focuses on the effects of weather variation or weather shocks rather than of climate change. That is a much slower process. This does not mean that slow onset events do not have any impact on children's well being. In epidemiological and environmental sciences, there is some evidence on the effects of slow onset climate events on child health and a household's income, which is one determinant of child well being. For instance, it has been proven by Kahn and co authors 
2011 that in Bangladesh, rising sea levels leads to an addition of salt water into drinking water and that this increases the risk of hypensive disorders during pregnancy, a leading cause of perinatal death in low-income countries. Also, there is some anecdotal evidence on melting glaciers reducing freshwater availability in countries dependent on seasonal glacial melt flow, like the Himalayas or Peru, or on ocean acidification leading to coral reef destruction, habitat loss, and consequent loss of fisheries and related livelihoods. Weather events are measured in different ways. We can be interested in measuring the frequencies at which a weather realization falls into different bins. For example, for temperatures, we can compute the number of days in a year that temperatures fall between 0 and 5 degrees. It can be interesting to measure the deviation in levels from the long-term mean. For example, again with temperature, we can measure the deviation of the average temperature in degrees Celsius over a year and compare it to the long-term temperature average in the same locality. When measuring deviations, authors often compute the variation in levels from the within-spatial area mean and then divide it by the within-spatial area standard deviation. In this approach, level changes matter not in an absolute sense, but in a proportion to an area's usual variation. For extreme weather events, different measures can be used according to the objective of the researcher. We can wonder if an event took place during a specific period. In that case, we can use dummies. For example, in order to indicate if a drought or a cyclone or a flood occurred in a specific year in a particular country or area of the country, we can define a dummy that is equal to 1 if the drought occurred, 0 if it did not. We can also count the number of extreme weather events that occurred in an area in the period of interest. For example, we could count the number of droughts that an individual experienced during their childhood. Finally, for some extreme events, we can calculate their severity. For example, for cyclones, we can use the Saffir-Simpson hurricane wind scale that classifies cyclones into five categories on the basis of the wind speed, from one that indicates the minimal strength between 119 to 153 kilometers per hour, to five that indicates the maximal strength, more than 252 kilometers per hour. Or, for droughts, we can use the SPEI, the Standardized Precipitation Evapotranspiration Index, elaborated by Vincente Serrano and co-authors in 2010, that is based on monthly precipitation and temperature data and presents both positive and negative values, identifying respectively wet and dry events. For example, an SPEI lower than minus 2 indicates an extreme drought, while an SPEI between minus 1 and minus 1.49 indicates a moderate drought. Weather data comes from different data sources. Precipitation and temperature data are collected by ground stations and by satellites. In this slide, we present the main data sources for ground station data. The main problem with ground station data for developing countries is that the quality of data depends on the availability of a sufficient number of stations to cover most of the country's area. In many developing countries, the weather monitoring budget is quite low. The number of ground stations is limited, and entry and exit of weather stations from the database is quite common. For those reasons, several research units or projects, like CRU at the University of East Anglia, decided to interpolate data from different ground stations in order to give a complete coverage for temperature and precipitations for the whole country and for all countries of the world. They usually provide daily temperatures or precipitations for grid cells of about 10 squared kilometers. However, this kind of data also presents some problems because, especially for precipitations that have a larger spatial variability than temperature, interpolations can induce poor data quality for the grid cells that are far from the ground stations. Temperature and precipitation data are also collected by satellites. Since that data collection started later in time, 
the data series they provide are shorter. Also, this data is usually provided for larger geographical areas. An interesting data source is CHIRPS from the Climate Hazard Center that combines measurements from ground stations with the ones from satellites and provides gridded data for precipitations. Data on cyclones is usually available at a resolution of 0.1 degrees. Data provided by the Global Risk Data Platform provides not only information on the occurrence of a cyclone in the grid cell, but also on its intensity, on the physical and economic exposure of the grid cell to cyclones, an estimate of the global risk induced by tropical cyclone hazards in the area. Sometimes different weather data sources give somewhat different information. For this reason, when possible, comparing results using different data sources is a good robustness check. In the microeconomic literature we're going to examine, researchers combine household or individual information from survey data with the weather conditions of the locality in which the household resides. This is possible because most of the survey provides GPS coordinates of the locations of the sample households. As said above, weather data is generally provided for a grid cell. In order to use weather data in microeconomic studies in combination with survey data, researchers link each survey location with the weather data of the grid cell in which the household resides. Moreover, since most data sources provide daily weather data, researchers usually aggregate data on a longer time frame, for example, a month, season, or year, according to the scope of their analysis and to the time frame of their survey data. For instance, an agricultural shock in a rural zone has a stronger impact on farmers' livelihoods when it happens during the agricultural season. When interested in measuring the effect of a drought on a rural population, researchers might want to aggregate rainfall data over the agricultural season only without considering data on rainfall outside the agricultural season. Let's now talk about timing and mechanisms of weather events. Weather events can have important effects on children's well-being through several dimensions, health, schooling, work, migration, marriage, and fertility in different channels. In the rest of the lecture, we'll present the main findings of the economic literature on each of these dimensions. Most of the effects we'll describe take place in the short term, meaning immediately after or a short time after the weather shock. But some of them can also have long-term effects, meaning that they can affect a person throughout their entire life. This is the case with the weather shocks that are experienced by children when in utero or in the first years of childhood that can affect their human capital at the adult age. In what follows, we first present the channels through which weather events can produce short-run effects on a number of outcomes related to children. We then present the main findings of the literature on the short-run effect of weather shocks on each of these outcomes. And after that, we'll show how some events can have long-lasting effects on children's well-being. A weather event can affect economic outcomes through three main mechanisms. The most evident is probably the disruption channel that is concerned in particular with the more severe weather events. Besides that, the other effects pass through the so-called income channel and the so-called opportunity cost channel. We now present the three channels. Weather shocks have direct and immediate effects on economic outcomes when they are very severe. Here we refer in particular to the extreme weather events that have disruptive power, like severe droughts, floods, and tropical storms. First of all, these kinds of events often cause losses of human lives and the destruction of physical capital and infrastructures with obvious negative economic consequences. For example, in 2004, cyclones Alita and Gefilo killed hundreds of people, left 200,000 people homeless, and destroyed about 1,400 schools throughout Madagascar. Moreover, some people's health is severely affected during these shocks both directly with a rise of disabilities or indirectly with a rise in the development of epidemics, the loss of medical personnel, or the increase of mental health problems. Schooling is directly affected by the destruction of school infrastructures, 
but also by the loss of teachers that, as medical staff and other key workers, could be personally affected by the shock and thus unable to teach. Human and physical capital destruction due to an extreme weather event determines important revenue losses for both the households and the state. Even when the weather shock has a smaller destructive power, it can affect economic outcomes through two main channels, the income and the opportunity cost channels. In order to illustrate these channels, let's make an example. Let's suppose, as in the work by Marchetta and co-authors, 2018, that we want to study the effects of a negative weather event on children's schooling and work in a rural area where agriculture is the prevalent source of income. In this context, a deficit in rainfall, with respect to the historical local trend, in the current agricultural season is considered as a negative weather shock. A negative weather shock decreases agricultural production and thus decreases the household's expected revenues in the current agricultural season. This implies a tightening of the budget constraints of the household that could mean taking the child out of school and asking her to enter into the labor market to help the family. This effect is called income effect or direct effect of the weather shock. In our example, the income effect is negative on schooling while it is positive on child work. More generally, when a household is hit by a negative weather shock, it often experiences a loss in income, in particular if it is in a rural area. The income reduction has important consequences on several family outcomes, including outcomes related to children, like education, work, health, etc. We'll see that in detail in the next section of the lecture, but we can anticipate that, for example, an income reduction due to a negative weather shock can oblige households to reduce health expenditures with detrimental effects on children's health, or it can push them to marry their daughters earlier in places where bride price is used in order to alleviate the budget constraints. Coming back to our example, worse weather conditions determine a decrease in labor productivity and in the opportunity cost of school. Parents could then be induced to send their children to school because their work productivity in the family farm is low. This effect is called the opportunity cost effect or the price effect or the indirect effect of the weather shock. In our example, the opportunity cost effect is positive for schooling and negative for child work. In our example, the two effects are thus opposite in sign meaning that the overall effect is ambiguous and needs to be empirically determined. Depending on the outcome we want to study, the two effects can go in the same direction or not. For example, we study the effects of rainfall shortages on fertility in a bride price area. We can expect the reduction of the household income due to shortfall in rain to anticipate marriage and thus childbearing but anticipation of childbearing can also be due to the decrease of the opportunity cost of having a child for women. In this case, the two effects go in the same direction. We will come back to this point later in the lecture. We will now talk about the short-term effects of weather events. We will now review the main findings of the economics literature with respect to the short-term effects of weather events experienced during childhood on children well-being. We start with presenting the findings on the effects on children health. We can distinguish here between the effects of weather shocks experienced when in utero and weather shocks experienced in early childhood. Weather shocks experienced when in utero lower the probability of the baby surviving to complete their first year of life. For instance, for instance, Merix 2021 shows that an increase in temperatures by 1 degree Celsius in less developed countries leads to an increase by 2.25 per 1,000 live births in the number of children dying before completing their first year of life. Rocha and Suarez 2015 find similar results in Brazil where negative rainfall shocks imply a higher infant mortality, shorter gestation periods, and lower birth weights. In Jamaica, 
Babies who experienced hurricanes or tropical storms in utero are also more likely to have low birth weights, according to Behrman and Pesha, 2020. They also keep presenting worse anthropometric measures, weight for age, weight for height, and height for age, during the first five years of life. Abiona, 2017, finds similar results after rainfall shocks in Malawi. Abiona, 2017, also finds that rainfall shocks experienced after birth but before age two influence children's anthropometric measures in their first five years of life. Still, shocks faced while in utero are those with the largest effect on anthropometric measures in early childhood. Her results are similar to those of Hodnot and Kinsey, 2001, who showed that children aged one to two years of age grow slower in the aftermath of a drought in Zimbabwe. Interestingly, these authors show that catch-up growth is limited, meaning that this unsteady growth has a permanent effect. Similarly, Datar and co-authors, 2012, observed that exposure to a natural disaster in the past year reduces height for age and weight for age Z scores and increases the likelihood of children stunting or being underweight under five years of age in India. It also reduces the likelihood of having full age-appropriate immunization coverage. Datar and co-authors, 2012, also observe immediate negative consequences of exposure to a natural disaster on illness, diarrhea, fever, and acute respiratory illness are more likely to occur in children under five years of age in the month following the weather event. Exposure to extreme weather events also determines an increase in the occurrence of mental health problems. In southern Thailand, seven to 14-year-old children were more likely to suffer PTSD symptoms and depression in provinces affected by the 2004 tsunami, two to nine months after the shock, according to Thankrua and co-authors, 2006. The disruption channel and the income channel are the mechanisms we presented above that explain the effects of weather shocks on child health. Let's look first at the disruption channel. Weather shocks have a disruptive effect on the environment, and this can lead to an increase of illness and health problems. For example, water scarcity during a drought might cause an increase of vector-borne diseases like diarrhea through unsafe water consumption and reduced hygiene practices. This has been shown by Bandio Padier and co-authors 2012 in Sub-Saharan Africa and by Rocha and Suarez, 2015, for northeastern Brazil. Similarly, water can be contaminated after a flood, which can release untreated sewage and wastewater into the water supplies. Another example, in areas where malaria is endemic, an important rise in precipitations can lead to more mosquitoes, thus increasing the prevalence of malaria. This has been observed by Kudamatsu and co-authors, 2012, in sub-Saharan Africa. Similarly, Henry and Dos Santos, 2012, show that a deficit in rainfall lowers the risk of malaria-related deaths for children younger than five years old in Burkina Faso in Mali. The income channel is also at work. Negative weather shocks often induce, especially for rural households, a decrease in production, including the production for auto consumption. This, coupled with a more general reduction in household incomes, might cause a reduction in calorie intake and a healthy variety of foods for kids, thus causing malnutrition and undernutrition. Malnutrition also increases because of the rise in food prices due to lower production and food availability. Finally, the reduction in revenues due to negative weather shock might force households to reduce health care expenditures. As discussed in the previous slide, weather shocks can affect a child's health throughout their childhood. Health conditions is demonstrated to have an influence on schooling and learning, 
Malnutrition and undernutrition are in fact correlated with low cognitive development. Thus, adverse weather events experienced during early childhood indirectly influence schooling and learning through their effects on children's health. Evidence for a number of developing countries exists in the literature. Malnutrition experienced in preschool years due to a drought has long-lasting effects on school grade attainment in Zimbabwe, as shown by Alderman et al., 2006. Children exposed to floods during early childhood have lower scores in language development, working memory, and visual-spatial thinking abilities by ages 2 to 6 in Mexico, as shown by Aguilar and Vaccarelli, 2011. And girls who experienced a drought before age 5 have lower cognitive skills by ages 11 to 14 in Kenya, as recently shown by Nubler and co-authors. They are also less likely to have ever enrolled in school, and when school, they attain lower grades. Lower school achievement of girls who experienced a shock in early life is mainly explained by Nubler and co-authors by their bad health conditions, which shape their schooling attitudes and expectations. Climactic events also have immediate effects on schooling and learning when experienced during school ages. First of all, in case of an extreme weather event such as a cyclone or a flood, schools and transport infrastructures might be destroyed and teachers could be personally affected by the shock and thus unable to teach. Even when the shock does not destroy infrastructures, school attendance might be at risk, in particular in rural areas where income strongly depends on land productivity. Here we find again the income and opportunity cost channel that have opposite effects. Let's take a look at an example of positive weather shock, like higher than usual rainfall. On one side, if households experience this positive weather shock, land productivity increases, revenues from agricultural production increase as well, and the additional income can be used to pay school direct costs and to maintain children in schools. Moreover, households have less need for children to work to provide an additional revenue. On the other hand, the rise in agricultural wages increases the opportunity cost of attending school. Households could then be prone to rely on child work. Increasing a child's workload can lead them to drop out from school or, a minima, to perform worse. Which effect prevails between income or opportunity cost depends on the context and the degree of imperfection of savings, credit, insurance, and labor markets. This table describes the main findings of literature on this topic. When the income channel prevails, it means that authors found that a positive shock has a positive effect on schooling and a negative effect on child work or that a negative shock has a negative effect on schooling and a positive effect on child work. For instance, Marchetta and co-authors, 2018, found that in Madagascar, income effect prevails, meaning that negative rainfall deviations reduce the probability of attending school and increases the probability of entering the labor market. Conversely, when opportunity cost prevails, Positive shocks lead to worse schooling outcomes and more child work, and negative shocks to better schooling outcomes and less child work. This is the case for the paper of Zimmerman, 2020, who finds that in India, negative rainfall shocks increase school enrollment and attainment and decrease the probability of working for children younger than 15. The studies mentioned here usually use school attendance or school enrollment as an outcome, but some of them also look at learning. This is the case of Bjorkman Nikvist, 2013, or Marchetta and co-authors, 2018, who show that a negative weather shock has detrimental effects on test scores the following year. The result is consistent with the one they find on schooling, meaning that, in this context, the income effect prevails. On the contrary, in India, Shaw and Steinberg, 2017, find that when a positive shock occurs during school ages, the opportunity cost effect prevails, 
and children perform worse in math. You must be aware that the economic literature, for example, Dion Vry and co-authors 2006, has well demonstrated that once children drop out of school after a temporary shock, any type of shock, not only weather shock, they have lower chances of going back to school later. Meaning that if the effect of the adverse weather shock on schooling is negative because the income channel prevails, this effect is not only immediate but long-lasting. The prevalence of the income or opportunity cost effect also depends on a child's characteristics that shape her or his productivity. If the shock occurs at ages when the child is able to work and can be considered as an adult substitute in the outside work world or with home production, it is more likely that the opportunity cost will prevail. For instance, Sean Steinberg, 2017, find that in India, a positive rainfall shock increases the probability that a child will drop out from school at ages 11 to 16, but not at ages 5 to 10. A child's gender is also at play. After a shock that negatively affects the agricultural output, farming households look for alternative income-generating activities. Their demand for child participation in home production can then increase to replace adults working outside. As girls are perceived as being more productive than boys in terms of home production, it is mostly their schooling and learning achievement that suffer from a negative weather shock, according to Bjorkman Nikvist, 2013, in Uganda. On the other hand, if after an extreme weather shock, households mostly require reparation work, boys' schooling will suffer the most. It is what has been found by Takasaki, 2017, in rural Fiji after a tropical cyclone. Most of the time, weather shocks speed up the transition from school to work because of market imperfections. For example, Marchetta and co-authors, 2018, find that negative rainfall deviations and cyclones encourage young Malagasy people to enter the workforce and to drop out of school. The effect is stronger for less wealthy households who cannot have access to credit and saving markets to cope with the shock. Labor markets are also important to mitigate the effect of weather shocks on child work in case of a shock that positively affects productivity. Dumas, 2020, demonstrates that parents dislike child work. If they have access to a labor market, they would rather hire non-household workers as a response to a positive productivity shock than use child work in Tanzania. We now move to the study of the effects of weather shocks on child migration. Child migration is a multifaceted phenomenon. Children can migrate with their family or alone. The displacement of the entire family could be a consequence of extreme weather shocks. In those cases, affected families generally move to other areas of the country or in neighboring countries that have not been affected by the shock. Here we focus on another type of child migration. We try to disentangle the reasons why weather shock should induce children to migrate alone, leaving the rest of the family back home. Children who migrate alone mostly move internally and they usually migrate to study to work for another household, or to marry. Why would children migrate due to a weather shock? Child migration can be used by households as a risk management tool. It can be used as a strategy to prevent the negative effects of an adverse weather shock or as a way to cope with them. Child migration can be used as a form of insurance against the negative effects of an adverse weather shock. Having one or several members who live elsewhere allows households to rely on them if the adverse weather event affects the location where they reside. As members living outside the areas are unaffected, they can send remittances to help their family to face the shock. Remittances can be used to buy new assets in case they have been destroyed by an extreme weather event or to loosen the budget constraints, which could be tight due to a weather shock. In some contexts, Households insure against spatial risk through marriage. In India, for example, marriage come migration is a very common strategy 
parents marry their daughters with spouses who live in regions far away from their home in order to protect themselves from a possible shock that might affect their homeland, but not the entire country. Often those girls are married at a very young age, while still a child. More details on child marriage and weather shocks will be provided in the next slide. Child migration could be used as a coping strategy by the family. Parents could ask the child to migrate as a response to a weather shock. If the shock tightens the family's budget constraints, children can be sent to another household to lower consumption of their original household. Moreover, if they work, they can send remittances. Evidence exists from Akrish, 2009, that households in Burkina Faso who suffer an unexpected but not necessarily weather-related agricultural event are more likely to send a 5- to 15-year-old daughter to another household. Households having a good network outside their living areas could easily use migration as a risk management tool. Using child migration as a coping mechanism is not possible for all households. Migration has a cost that is not easily affordable for poor households, and the adverse weather event might further impoverish them, as shown by Azari and Signorelli, 2020. As we have seen, in the case of migration, the income channel has contrasting effects. On one side, by decreasing income, a negative weather shock induces the migration of one or more than one household member, including the younger ones. On the other hand, the decrease in income makes migration less likely to occur because migration costs cannot be afforded. The opportunity channel is instead unambiguous. As labor productivity decreases because of the weather shock in the affected area, the opportunity cost of migrating out of the area of origin decreases as well, thus pushing migration. There is growing literature that studies how migration is used as an adaptation or coping strategy to face adverse weather events. Some authors analyzed age-specific patterns of weather-induced migration, and just a few studies have explored the effects of climate change on child migration. It has been shown by De France and Goubert, 2020, for Mali, and Baez and co-authors, 2017, for Northern Latin America and the Caribbean, that youths between 15 and 25 to 29 years of age are the most likely to migrate after a drought or rainfall shortages. The effects of changes in rainfall and temperature on children have been explored by Weinreb, 2020, for sub-Saharan Africa, but without finding any conclusive result. As discussed before, marrying a child can be a strategy to ensure against negative consequences of climate-related shocks when child marriage implies a relocation of the child to a different geographical area. More in general, child marriage could be influenced by the occurrence of a weather shock in different ways. In case of an adverse weather shock, parents could decide to marry a child, more often a daughter, in order to reduce household consumption. If a child relocates to the spouse's household, their family has one less mouth to feed. On the other hand, losing a member of the household potentially reduces home production and household revenue if this person is engaged in the labor market. Moreover, in some countries, like in several sub-Saharan African countries, the family of the bride receives a payment at marriage from the groom's family. This custom is called bride price. In some other countries, like in several southeastern Asian countries, it is the bride's family who makes a payment to the groom's family. This custom is called a dowry. We thus see that there can be both benefits and costs of marrying a daughter. In case of an adverse weather shock, households compare the benefits and the costs they would have if they decide to marry their daughter. They would probably marry her if benefits exceed costs. Recently, Corno and co-authors showed that in settings where bride price is customary, young girls whose families experienced a drought are more likely to be married before their 19th birthday. On the contrary, in contexts where dowry is customary, a drought's occurrence can postpone a girl's marriage. 
In the case of bride price customs, both income and opportunity cost effects can cause households to hasten their daughter's marriage. The income effect leads households to look for alternative sources of income, and bride price can be a new source. Moreover, the opportunity cost of marriage decreases as a daughter's productivity on the fields drops after a negative weather shock. In the case of dowry customs, the two effects go in opposite directions. The quality of marriage can also be affected by weather shocks. In a poor southwestern area of Bangladesh, a country where the dowry is customary, some parents accept a less desirable partner for their daughter after a negative income shock in order to have a lower dowry to pay. Women who marry during dry periods have indeed poorer and less educated husbands who are also more prone to intimate partner violence. In Sub-Saharan Africa, Highland and Russ, 2018, found that rural women who were exposed to a drought in their early childhood were more likely to have a partner who makes the decisions for the household alone. Reduction in age at marriage due to droughts could be associated with changes in fertility. This is because there is a strong relationship between age at marriage and the age at first childbearing. Anticipating marriage often determines the anticipation of the first childbearing. In the sub-Saharan African countries, where bride price is customary and marriage is anticipated due to weather shocks, Corno and co-authors, 2020, found that a drought leads to a 4% increase in the annual probability of having a child before turning 18, and that the number of children a woman reports is 1% higher when she faced a drought during her teenage years. Weather events can affect fertility through other mechanisms than early childbearing. Weather shocks can affect fertility through an income effect. Parents can choose to avoid having children when they suffer a negative income shock as they cannot take charge of an extra child. For instance, in Tanzania, Alam and Portner, 2018, find that households decide to delay pregnancies after a crop loss, not necessarily weather-related. Fertility behavior could also be indirectly affected by the effects of weather shock on infant mortality that we illustrated earlier. Women might respond to a baby's death by shortening intervals between pregnancies in order to replace the deceased babies, thereby increasing fertility. The opportunity cost is also at work. The decrease in labor productivity after a negative weather shock lowers the opportunity cost of childbearing. Desi and co-authors, 2019, find that in Madagascar, Drought occurrence determines an increase in fertility shortly after the shock for young women, even in the absence of an effect on child marriage. This effect persists in the long run. Malagasy women have higher completed fertility when they faced a negative rainfall shock at a young age. Part 4 is about intergenerational and long-term effects of weather events. In the previous section, we analyzed the short-term effects of weather events on a number of outcomes. We showed that negative weather events occurring in childhood have direct effects on schooling and health outcomes by potentially reducing infrastructures and disrupting the health environment. Weather events can also have indirect effects on education and health by modifying a household's income and distorting school opportunity costs. The variation in agricultural output can make households adjust the members' nutritional intake. Yet, when children are not sufficiently fed, they are less healthy and perform worse in school. Moreover, less healthy children have generally lower schooling outcomes. These short-term effects of weather events might have important repercussions in the long run. The long-lasting effect on schooling is self-evident. In most cases, individuals carry on throughout their lives with the schooling level they attained in childhood. So, if a child attained less schooling or learned less because of a negative weather event, she will have a lower educational level and lower cognitive skills in adulthood. Education is also a key variable to explain women empowerment. 
as weather shocks limit schooling and learning, it can have a long-lasting effect on women's agency. Moreover, when girls anticipate marriage because of a negative weather shock, they will be probably less empowered as their husbands are more likely to make most of the household decisions and more inclined to engage in intimate partner violence, as we saw before. Concerning health, the effects also persist in the long run in most cases. As we saw before, negative shocks cause children to grow up in a less nurturing environment with important short-run implications on their nutrition and health status. But the health status in adulthood is strongly correlated to the health status in childhood, as described in the child health capsule of this course. For example, taller, able-bodied adults are generally those who grew up as healthy children. Exposure to extreme weather events during childhood is thus likely to influence an individual's health in adulthood. This has been proven for women both in Indonesia by Machini and Yang, 2009, and in sub-Saharan countries by Highland and Russ, 2018, who use women's height to measure their health status at adulthood. According to these authors, the long-term effect on health is particularly visible in rural settings where the impact of adverse weather shocks on agricultural output and on household revenues is strongest. Women who experienced a negative weather event in their early childhood also have a higher probability to die during childbirth, according to Comfort, 2016. Finally, Dinkelman, 2016, found that drought exposure during early childhood in South Africa at apartheid time raised later life physical and mental disabilities. The economic literature has widely proved that human capital is a key variable to explain labor productivity. For more details, you can look at the capsules on child health and schooling in this course. Better educated and healthier individuals are the more productive ones and are thus able to gain a higher wage. Therefore, we can infer that weather events experienced during childhood are also likely to affect individual income in adulthood. Some evidence exists in the literature for this for women. Machini and Yang, 2009, found, for example, that Indonesian women who experienced positive rainfall at their time of birth were less poor in adulthood. Similarly, Highland and Russ, 2018, found that sub-Saharan women exposed to drought during their early childhood were less wealthy as adults. Exposure to weather shocks in early childhood might have intergenerational impacts. This passes first through the influence of a mother's health. Indeed, poorer health conditions of women who suffered from a negative weather event in their early childhood led them to give birth to low-weight babies, as shown by Highland and Russ, 2009. The intergenerational impact also affects the wealth of the household in the empowerment of mothers. Poorer households and less empowered mothers invest less in their offspring schooling and health. The existence of second generation effects indicates that it is important to implement solutions to mitigate the effect of weather shocks to try to avoid the perpetuation of poverty. The final part of this course is about potential solutions to mitigate the adverse effects of weather events on child well-being. All through this lecture, we discussed several mechanisms at play behind the effects of weather shocks on child well-being. Depending on the shock and on the channels through which it produces negative effects, several policies can be implemented to mitigate these effects, both ex ante as prevention or mitigation strategies and ex post to help people to cope with the consequences of the shock. When the risk of extreme weather events with large disruptive effects is high, it is mostly infrastructures that need to be improved ex ante. If buildings, roads, electrical grid, and water storage solutions are resistant to extreme weather events, the detrimental effects of the shock on well-being could be mitigated. Workfare programs could also speed up the recovery of the area and its population by relying on beneficiaries to repair damages caused by the shock. 
This type of program also helps to compensate the loss of jobs due to the shock. Awareness campaigns on good practices in case of extreme weather events is also an important tool to limit the loss of human lives. We saw that by affecting incomes, negative weather shocks have detrimental effects on child health, schooling, work, and marriage. Improving savings, formal credit, and insurance markets could help households to cope with the loss of income without reducing the investment in their children's human capital. After a shock, households can rely on their savings and or formal credit and insurance institutions to mitigate their loss of income. As an adaptation strategy, some households members can work outside the family farm to diversify sources of income in case of a weather shock that mostly affects agricultural output like droughts or floods. After the shock, the household can rely on those members to hopefully provide a sufficient income to support health and schooling expenditures of the whole family. Farming households can also use more resistant agricultural technologies, for example, better irrigation systems and more resilient crops, to lower the loss of income in case of a negative shock that affects crops. Resilient and well-managed water storage solutions are also a helpful tool to maximize water utilization for crops in case of droughts and to limit vector-borne diseases or water scarcity. Furthermore, improving the transmission of information regarding weather forecasts can help farmers to anticipate a weather shock by precipitating or postponing planting and or harvesting. Sufficient cash and in-kind food transfers conditional on school attendance and or specific health practices could also be a way to limit the effect of an income drop on child schooling and health outcomes. These types of programs also reduce the opportunity cost of going to school instead of working. As shown by Dumas 2020 and described earlier in the lecture, the access to a labor market to hire non-family workers is another important means to mitigate the effect of a positive productivity shock on child work. In regards to health, besides water storage solutions, some actions can be taken to limit the deterioration of the public health environment. For instance, mosquito nets can be distributed after a flood to limit the transmission of malaria. Facilitating family reunions after an extreme weather shock is also important to reduce its detrimental effect on mental health. According to Baez, 2010, the most efficient policies to help children to suffer less from weather shocks are those that target the most precisely vulnerable population, like farming households relying on rain-fed agriculture, as well as women and children. A special focus should be made for very young children in their first 1,000 days of life, the time spanning roughly between conception and their second birthday, as shocks which occur during this period are those that have larger, long-lasting effects. In this lecture, we presented the economic literature that shows how children in the developing world particularly suffer from the effects of extreme and less extreme weather events. In the previous slide, we showed which solutions can be adopted to mitigate these negative effects. But if weather shocks are more and more frequent these days, and also more severe, it is because the climate is slowly changing, and this tendency is likely to continue to worsen over the coming decades, even if we take drastic actions now. For example, there's quite a long lag time when greenhouse gases emitted today will remain in the atmosphere. Thus, it is urgent to act as soon as possible in order to limit the increase of weather shocks that negatively affect child well-being. We also briefly mention in this lecture the non-economic literature showing that slow-onset climactic events like rising sea levels, melting glaciers, or ocean acidification have a direct negative impact on child well-being. All existing evidence clearly indicates that there is a pressing need for climate action in line with the Paris Agreement to protect children's rights to life, survival, and development, as stated in Article 6 of the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child.
We can conclude by quoting Save the Children when they wrote, Climate change is happening at an alarming pace, and without urgent action, children of present and future generations will bear the greatest burden.